uh, Western provinces as well in that regard, uh, just based on kind of location, uh, transportation costs, um, et cetera. But it is, uh, you know, we have had uh, FTAs. I would also add Chile in there as well, um, but not a little bit farther south. But just the ability to, or the recognition that South America itself is a large market, untapped, frankly, from a broader Canadian perspective, and and a, uh, you know a number of countries that we haven't necessarily focused on, um, but do provide tremendous advantages um, to Canadian companies and exporters. And I think a, a lot of opportunity, untapped opportunities, I would say, uh, to your point. Uh, and and so I think you know this is a uh, you know another foot uh, into the marketplace. I think it's, um, again, it, it, it's, it, it's a small foot for the time being, but it, it can lead somewhere else. And I think that's important as well uh, as we look to negotiate the FTA is that it's not just about today and kind of where we are at in terms of our trade, but what about tomorrow, next year, uh, in five, ten years? That's, that, that's also important. So, You mentioned about the new president. Uh, you know, in the past they were considered protectionists, uh, just what you read. Um, but you mentioned about the opportunities of creating a progressive agenda. And in your remarks, you mentioned that uh, not only uh, monetary, but you know, through gender, indigenous, uh, environment. Um, how does that work, and where do you see the opportunities? Well, I, um, so we traditionally, when you talk about uh, free trade agreements, it's, it's a lot about trading goods, uh, trading services. Um, and, and you know, over the last uh, number of years, uh, decades, uh, we have expanded that trade and environment, uh, trade and gender, trade and SMEs, trade and indigenous peoples. And so these are the, you know, the trade and issues that we often talk about. Um, and and it, I think it, it provides an opportunity for uh, Canada writ large to um, promote, uh, export our, uh, the way we do things, the way we deal with all of those uh, uh, issues outside of the sort of the traditional trade agreement areas, and I think it's it's it is important um, to to recognize that and to look to to try and export that as well. Uh, I think I said that um, Ecuador is a country that uh, has indicated an openness to these uh, to these other areas. They are uh, participant in a, um, a number of uh, you know the uh, environment issues beyond trade. You know whether that's at uh, um, whether that is at the UN or elsewhere, uh, but it, it's important to bring some of those areas into trade to the trade agreements to the greatest extent possible. And when you have a willing partner, uh, I think it makes it much easier uh, and uh, much more beneficial uh, for the for the two parties. So. Thank you very much. And how much time? One minute. One minute. Okay. So the the whole trade with um, Ecuador. There seems to be a, a lot, a lot of opportunities, and, and some of the things that you were talking about, I had asked uh, the earlier panel about some of the recent agreements that they, they had signed around gender and around um, being more open with trade. So, you know, different elements are written right into the agreement, thereby defining how we can do this, or is it, you know what I mean? It's in black and white, right? And then how do you enforce things like that as it go goes on? Very much depends on, thank you for the question, it very much depends on the chapter uh, and what is being negotiated. So I think in, in many of those chapters, um, uh, not all, but many of them, um, uh, they're cooperation based, not necessarily, not subject to dispute settlement. So um, it, it's very much the case that, these, that both countries are like-minded on certain issues. And so um, provides you with the opportunity, the framework, if you will, to have those uh, discussions and to have those um, uh, to set up um, uh, to make sure that both countries have the right people in place, the right people around the table after the agreement is negotiated, uh, to be able to um, uh, have further engagement on wh whichever topic is, is at issue. And so um, uh, I think that that's helpful. Um, again, they're not, a lot of those areas are not necessarily subject to dispute settlement. So you know, to your point about, you know, is there a way to hold their feet to the fire. I think the, the way to do that is through engagement. Um, and I think that's what we have found over the years. as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Savard Tremblay, for two and a half minutes, please. Merci. Uh, je voudrais revenir sur la question. Thank you. I'd like to come back to the issue of dispute settlement between investors and the state. Can you inform the committee on the total number 
of suits, uh, prosecutions that Canada has had, and the number of uh, cases where we were successful in those prosecutions. Yes, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, in terms of the amount of cases brought against Canada, um, 35 cases uh, in total, uh, almost all of those under the NAFTA, one under uh, foreign invest investment protection we have with Egypt. Um, in under those cases, uh, Canada uh, won 13 of those. Five of those cases we did not win. Five of those cases were settled. Uh, six of them are ongoing, and seven are either inactive, terminated, or withdrawn. That now um, I've count, I've double counted one particular case, and that's the Bill Con case, because there was a finding, but it is still ongoing. There's a there's a there's a there's a damages uh, part to to settle. Um, so that's the total number. Et combien de cas parmi ceux-ci ont été des And how many of those cases were settled out of court and uh, resulted in a withdrawal from uh, measures in place or political will or whatever? If I understood the question correctly, um, in terms of cases, uh, I'll just come back again to the numbers first and then part, second part of the question. But... Uh, as I said, five cases were settled, and seven of them were either inactive, terminated, or withdrawn. Um, when they're withdrawn, those are, I can tell you because in a couple of those cases, I was trade counsel uh, historically. Um, those were cases that in a consultation setting, for example, uh, two of them I can think of uh, were withdrawn by the investor. Uh, they were hoping they could, at that point, get some type of settlement. We said, no, we'll be defending that vigorously. They decided to withdraw that case uh, to avoid costs against them, for example. Uh, but I think you had a quite part of your question had to do with uh, measures and some measures being withdrawn. Is that correct? In, in my understanding, in no case were, was a measure withdrawn because under investor state, there's only one thing that a tribunal can do if there is a case where they have found a breach, and that is to award damages. They cannot order a, a country in our cases, that, or sorry, uh, treaties with Canada, to withdraw a measure. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Candings for two and a half minutes, please. Well, thank you. And I'm going to, you know, at the start, uh, Mr. Forsyth, you mentioned there will be chapters or language on Indigenous peoples, on human rights, on the environment. And yet there will also be an, an investor chapter with ISDS mechanisms. And here we have a case in Ecuador, it seems to me, that one of the main conflicts around human rights and the environment, Indigenous peoples in Ecuador, happen, unfortunately, because of Canadian investors. And the ISDS is being used to protect them from efforts from a, an Ecuadorian government to legislate to protect its own peoples and its own environment. And I'm just wondering how, why are we doing this? Why, how are we helping the Ecuadorian people by combining those two things? And, um, you know, there, you know, there's this right to regulate language, but in in Colombia we have an agreement that language proved useless, and when the Colombian government tried to uh, regulate around the Canadian mining firm Eco Oro, it used that ISDS provision, and the Colombian government lost when they felt that this mining company was damaging the environment. I'm I'm really struggling here how this helps Canada or how it helps Ecuador, how we can regulate UNDRIP in this situation when we have a clear case of an Ecuadorian government and a Canadian company that is flaunting the whole free prior and informed consent aspect of UNDRIP. It just, I don't know, I am 
lost. I, I can't see why we're even thinking of uh, undertaking this, uh, these negotiations with, if that's our baseline. Thank you for the question. Uh, so I think in our current uh, model and the model that we've proposed uh, to work with Ecuador on, uh, we, it's careful to balance, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the rights of investors uh, through obligations, protections, and a mechanism to do that, but with the right to regulate the protection in areas such as the environment, labor, uh, human rights, etc. And we think that this model that we have now, much, much different than a 1997 model, strikes that balance. And I'll give you a few examples. We've talked uh, a few times about right to regulate provisions. Those were not in our old model. They are currently, as of CETA going forward, they are in all our, our FTAs across the board, not just on investment. Um, another uh, thing we've done is to strengthen, I talked about the balance, um, we've strengthened substantive provisions, for example, in the investment chapter, like expropriation. So, for example, the mere effect on an investor's uh, investment is not amount to an expropriation. This is something that we've clarified in our, our provisions that wasn't there in the past. And third, um, both parties in a treaty can take reservations to protect their public policy space in areas that they feel need protection. And we do that as a matter in, in regularly, and so do our partners. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you very much. That was a very lengthy question that would probably take the entire panel, but uh, you know, you had an extra minute there, but y you do get two and a half minutes if we get to another round, so maybe they can finish the answer then, so my apologies. Mr. McGuire, please, for five minutes. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to start off with a couple of simple questions that I had about uh, uh, the export products uh, in wheat. Uh, you mentioned uh, wheat and pulse crops, particularly lentils, being a uh, priority. Um, have we any idea of the volumes that we're trading in that area in, the, in, in either of those products right now? <coughs> So our um, a dollar value, I, I thank you, Madam Chair. I give you dollar value of our imports, like, but if that's okay. So in fact, wheat is our wheat is our top uh, duty bill export uh, into the Ecuador's market, and uh, we sent uh, an average over the time period from 2019 to 2022. We sent uh, about 260 million, 261 million dollars worth of exports so um sure. totally. the average from 2019 to 2022 so per year uh, u.s dollars so um any uh in the mineral side is there, is potash involved in that as well um i don't see potash as a top 10 export um but nevertheless I, i'm not sure what their 